Welcome to another episode of One-on-One -on -one with Mitch Lafon. I am your host, Mitch Lafon. This episode brought to you by the Heavy Montreal Festival, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in beautiful downtown Montreal, Quebec, Canada. This year on the bill, you've got Slipknot, Faith No More, Corn, Bullet for My Valentine, and of course, my favorites, Lita Ford, Warrant, and Dokken. Uh, joining me as guest this week is James Kotak of The Scorpions and, of course, Barry Stock of Three Days Grace. And uh, my co-hosts are none other than from The Killer Dwarves, Rust Dwarf, and everybody's favorite singer, um, Darren James Smith, now of Harem Scarum. Or should I say now or a return to Harem Scarum, right, Darren? Always have been part of Harem Scarum. They're my brothers, so. That's right. That's right. And, and their last album, Thirteen, by the way, is fantastic. I mean, uh, did you play much of Thirteen? I did all the the backup vocals on everything on that record. Any drumming? No, I was busy out touring with another band at that time. Right, right. That's right. And uh, we'll, we'll maybe we'll talk about that at some later date. But today we're gonna we're gonna stick to all the positive stuff. And Russa. Uh, How's it going in your part of the world? Are you still buried under 18 feet of snow? I am. Um, it's the, the roof caved in, and I'm living in the shed out in the backyard. Uh, right, and as a he first, actually he, he made me go up there to shovel his driveway last week, so. <laughs> there you go. Well, you're, a lot, you're a lot younger than me. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so Darren and, and Russ, you know, we, we're, we're talking about the Scorpions with James Kotak. They're on tour later this year with Queensryche. Their new album, Return to Forever. For me personally, I think it's great. But I was more of an 80s Scorpions fan. And this has this 80s sound. It doesn't have that sort of classic 70s sound that, that you know, with Uli and all that. Um, anybody toured with the Scorpions? Are you friends with the Scorpions? Have you met them? What's your take on them? Darren? I, I've, I've never toured with the Scorpions. I've just been a fan since I heard rock and roll. You know, I mean, I've loved everything they've done. They always manage to make a comeback. They always manage to, you know, rock me. You know, it's, yeah. I love it. Yeah. And Russ, you? Yeah. No, I'm I'm a huge fan in the divorce world. I was a huge, huge fan. Dunk actually toured a bunch with the Scorpions. Right, with, with, Laidlaw. Uh, with Laidlaw, right? They went out with yeah. Scorpions. Yeah. He's so. probably done. The stories and a, and a good friend of ours is the road manager, but uh, you know they've always been a classic uh, rock metal band, and they put on the best show ever. So if you've never seen the Scorps, you got to go see them. They're just uh, fabulous. Yeah, they really are. So, in fact, why don't we just get right into the interview with James and uh, listen to what he's got to say? James always been a favorite of mine, and in fact, we mentioned that Warrant was coming to Heavy Montreal. Uh, one of the first times I ever met. Uh, James was when he actually was with Warrant, and this is going back, oh God, uh, 15, 20 years or so, when he, he, he was briefly their mm -hmm. drummer. Um, here we are. Here's James Kotak. Let's, uh, let's get started then. Let's, in fact, let's, uh, let's start right at the top here with Return to uh, Forever. Um, you know, listen, the band had announced that it was on a farewell tour, The Last Sting, there was going to be no more, and yet here you are again. So, so what what was the decision in terms of putting together these songs? Well, it's funny, the, 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 the whole farewell tour was, you know, when it started in 2010, we were all kind of, hmm, and then 11, then t by 2012, it was like, hmm, the, the demand was so incredible, and we were having so much fun, and it was like, well, now what do we do? You know, and then 2013, we did the uh, MTV Unplugged because there was one more album due to the record label. Mm -hmm. And there's always some kind of politics. And then there's all these songs that er we, that everybody had been throwing around that didn't make it on Sting in the Tail. And then the talk it gradually turned to, well, let's do another album. And that means another tour and the whole deal. And... Um, so when these songs came up, I mean, it was like instant. It's the same two producers, Michael and Martin, who did mm -hmm. Sting in the Tail, uh, Come Black, and MTV Unplugged. And you know what? They, it was originally, this album was meant to be as like an outtakes album, where we went back and took old tracks from that didn't make it on previous albums, and we were going to take those and put them out. Well, that started, there was like about 12 or 14, maybe more of those. Then it turned into like there was only about eight. And then there's a few choruses. And in between, all these new songs popped up. And that's where it all happened. And just it was just like 
wow. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but this is over a period of months. And uh, gosh, once I heard, you know, some of the ideas, I, I was just like super excited and the whole band was. Yeah, and to try to explain to me, why does a band even need to say farewell? I mean, you know, Kiss tried and couldn't do it. Ozzy tried and couldn't do it. The Who, But I mean, it's not like being a baseball player. It's not that your knees start hurting and you can't throw the ball anymore. Why? Why was it even considered? Well, actually, it is like that. We all, I mean, we all have a few problems. I have arthritis in my right big toe and, you know, problems. Everybody has their own personal problems because, you know, we're not 25 anymore. But the reason is you want to go out on top. You don't want to end up, your, there's some bands, the crowds just get less and less every year. And here you got these, you know, some older guys playing in, in a, a bar for, or at a house of blues for 200 people. That's sad. Right. And this band never wants to do that. It wants to go out classy and on top. And as long as, you know, there's, there's a new play. We're going to China this year for the first time. And there's a lot of countries we have played where we've been offered and didn't have the time. And the demand is there. You know, it's like, like who knew, like, look at Kiss. Kiss is bigger now than they've ever been. Absolutely. Oh, agree. Because, because the demand is there. And also, I think it's a lack of new 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 bands coming up and new spectacle rocks and classic rock is riding, riding a wave. So good for us. Yeah, really, absolutely. Now, when they announced, when the guys came to you and said, or management, whoever comes to you and says, all right, listen, we're going to be the last tour, we're going to end off, what do you say? Do you think, okay, do I go and start a new band? Do I, do I go be an accountant? Like, what, what was plan B for you? Well, funny you would say that, because it started being talked about in 2009, and then uh-huh. when 2010 we were making the album, and they said, oh, this is going to be the final sting. Well, as a matter of fact, I did form a new band. I, I started Project Rock with Kerry Kelly from Alice Cooper yeah. and uh, t- Tim Ripper Owens on vocals and uh, uh, Rudy Sarzo on bass and uh, t- Teddy Zigzag you know, from Guns N' Roses. I started the band. We did like uh, two tours of Russia and we, uh, we played at Grass Pop and we were up and running. And then all of a sudden, Klaus calls me, uh, I think January of last year and says, hey man, you know, can you stop playing with all these, this other band? And I was going to do a Kingdom Come reunion. Oh, really? I, we, Kingdom Come, we actually, the original five, we actually got together and rehearsed in L.A. And, I mean, I was, like, like taking it really serious. And then Klaus calls and goes, oh, yeah, you, you, you know, we finally decided we're going to continue on. So can you stop doing what you're doing? I'm, like, going, well, I've kind of got, like, <laughs> this going and that going and tour date offers. So I was, like, gearing up for, like, a big year for 2000. Uh, 14 but i just put the brakes on and here we are now are those projects that you might revisit anyway after the scorpions tour is done because there there will be some off time coming up probably in the next like 16 months or so um yeah we're 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 basically full time between now and april of 2016 and knowing these guys will probably end up doing something through the summer like festivals or like you know go hit, hit north america again because there's so many places to play and, and Canada, you know, just all over. But um, I mean, those projects are things I want to do, but it's next to impossible to do play, be in, do Scorpions full time and even have anything on the side because it's always, you know, busy. Which is not really a bad thing. Um, no, it's great. Have they talked about this being the absolute last one returned to forever? Or is it now open ended where it's like, it'll just be I, what it'll be? I think it's going to be what, like, it, it'll be what it's be. We're not putting any deadline on it because, honestly, the, the shows it, it just have been so much fun. I mean, for in the last couple of years, it's been awesome. So we're not really, you know, we're we're just kind of living in the moment because right now there's so much to do. The the movie just got done uh, uh, forever and a day, mm-hmm. and the album just got released over here. It's going to come out in North America soon, uh, and. There's just so much going on. All we can think about is we're getting the production together for the tour, you know, new drum sets coming, new guitar amps, new everything. And it's, 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 it's a lot to take in. Yeah. Now I'm looking, you know, I've listened to the album a bunch of times and I love it, but Thanks. lyrically, some of the songs almost seem like farewell letters. You've got uh, a song on the bonus uh, or in the bonus tracks or in the deluxe edition called crazy ride which was like, lyrically, it talks about this was a crazy ride. And, you know, we're, we're glad that we were on it. And, and you've got going out with a bang and and, right. and, st- and stuff like that. Uh, just tell me how, what the songwriting process was. Was there sort of this, we need to say goodbye? 
Well, you know what? Uh, of course, Klaus writes the majority of all the lyrics. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. I, I don't. What was the crazy? The crazy song I, I don't know is, is from Klaus from a from. It, that was I think an outtake. Okay. And but this these. I, I couldn't really tell you exactly lyrically where where it all came came from because I wasn't there when when Klaus was writing it because we're in four different five different countries on any given day sometimes, but I do know it is kind of like re, it's meant to be reflective. It's talking about you know uh, here you know the uh, what's the the rock is rolling home. I mean it is all very sentimental. Going out with a bang, yeah. No, I love it. I I really think. I really think fans, if they if they give it an open mind, that they're, they're really going to love this. And and the reason I say that is because with the Scorpions, much like with Kiss, there seems to be uh, the older fans that only like what was done in 1974, and then there is newer fans that only like what was done in the last 10 years. Um, where do you fall in all of that in terms of Scorpion stuff, and and sort of how do you balance it out in in the set list? Uh, well, you know what? <clears throat> Funny, sorry. Excuse me. Um, I, where I personally fell in, fell in because when I was, you know, in the late seventies and the early eighties, you know, of course I love Scorpions. They were on the radio every 10 minutes and I listened to radio constantly because I was in a band and playing in clubs and playing, I was playing Rocky like a hurricane and no one like you. And you know, when they came out in clubs <laughs> and then, uh, and then as things went on and then I joined the band and I felt like that was kind of like, you know, I look, the band has been in thirds, you know, from like 1965 till 79 that was the first third. Then from 79 to 96, that was the second third. And then the third third was from the time I joined. That's how I see that. And, you know, for, for, for a lot of the kids, if you go to any of these shows, and, man, you'll see the majority of the kids on the floor, if there's 10,000 people there, 5,000 of them there are under 25. Yeah. And then you have the gray hairs up and the sitting down up there. But, I mean, it, it's really amazing, the, the youth at the shows. And that says something right there. There's a There's a reason for it yeah now 50th anniversary tour is there anything uh in particular that's going to be special for any of the shows are, are you bringing out you know a whole new lighting whole new backdrop or, or are you just well no no that's that's what i said before no there's all new production all new lighting all new uh, everything i mean everything you can think of you know we have the massive video walls but they're updated and uh, speaking of the set list, that's what we've been talking about for the last couple months. There's uh, we we go back and forth, and I say this and that. I send like twelve songs that I want to do, and then here's another five coming in, and then we're all putting it together. And there's songs from the new album, and you got to play something from Sting in the Tail, and so it's very difficult. But that's why actually this week we're in Germany and we're working with the producers because they've been involved with the band so much in the last six years. They're actually giving us a kind of an outside perspective of what songs to take and redo and soup up and change and an entire new set list. It's very difficult to do that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Now, let's go okay. back. Let's go back in your history a little bit. Ultraphobic with the band Warrant. Right. Um, that, that album seems to have actually garnered favor over the last five or six years. People seem to have really hated it when it came out. And now people go, wow, man, that was a really heavy album what was your memory of making that was, was that a good time for you did you think oh my god what is this crap or were you like hey this is fantastic no, you know what that was actually a, 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 a new beginning for me as far as being in a band because yeah. after kingdom come i mean I, I did a string of albums i did with michael shanker and, mm-hmm. and this one and that one i mean i was all over the place i did like 20 albums in about four years with just just you know ghost drumming and then uh, we were we were actually the way that the Warren thing came about. I was working with Janie Lane, me and Rick Steyer from Kingdom Come. We were working with Janie Lane on his solo stuff, right. and then that morphed when his solo thing was like messy, whatever. It it wasn't come together. It just made sense. Me and Rick joined Warrant, new album deal on the table, and honestly, that Ultraphobic album is one of my top five albums I've ever done, and it's really good and it stands the test of time. And that's why at the time the '90s sucked for rock. It really face did. It. Once Nirvana came along, it was downhill from there. I mean, I, I, I like some of their songs and stuff, but the, the whole alternative movement, it was just like, there, there was just so much crap. There was some great stuff. I mean, Soundgarden and this one, it could go on forever. But for the most part, it was really bad for hard rock. And, uh, but, you know, that's why, uh, you know, people go back and look at things, you know, and, and so I, I'm really proud of that album. Plus, I co-wrote quite a few of the songs on there. 
Yeah, it's it's a great album, and in fact, uh, Thank you. Warrant is going to be playing Montreal about a month before the Scorpions this year. So <laughs> there you go. Maybe they'll pull out some of that stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Kingdom Come. That first album in '88, um, what was you know reached number twelve on Billboard, made a big splash. Um, Lenny was compared to Robert Plant. This was there was a whole Led Zeppelin thing. You have Bob Rock producing it. Yeah. Um, how come the band didn't end up having five, six albums? Why, why did it stop at two? Well, I hate to say it, but there, you know, there's uh, was somebody in the band who said the wrong thing to the press and uh, created a lot of bad blood. And you can live and die by the press, oh, yeah. especially back in the eighties. I mean, I hate to say it, but look what happened to Quiet Riot. Uh -huh. You know, uh, R.I.P. You know, Kevin DeBro, but man, his mouth ruined that band. Just too much talking and talking. And we had a similar situation where instead of accepting the compliments, hey, man, you guys sound like Led Zeppelin, it was like, oh, no, we don't. You know, and I, I was the complete opposite. I, if I was ever asked, who's your favorite drummer? I'd say, John Bonham. Who's your favorite band? Led Zeppelin. I mean, if you're going to be compared to somebody, be compared to the very best. And that's what was my whole attitude the whole time. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the second album came and went. And, uh, you know, it just things happen you know it's not always about the music it's a lot of politics involved and uh that was it you know and, you know our the manager who who got the whole thing together about halfway through he kind of lost it and, and wasn't around anymore and he was really in charge of everything so there was a lot of things involved yeah and i and i, and I know people listening to this or or you know are going to say hey the band went on and did like 10 albums but no, it wasn't a. It was Lenny, you know, right. doing his thing, and and you know he's an excellent vocalist and really and whatever. But as far as the other thing, I mean, I've been talking to Lenny since nineteen. I mean, two thousand nine, really talking serious, trying to get this this Kingdom Come thing back together, and then it just fizzled, you know. And even when I was uh, basically, I was asked by Klaus, hey, you know, don't do any outside stuff. Then I said, okay, guys, go ahead and go on without me, and nothing happened. They had gigs on the table. The four of them could have gone done anything. Just get another drummer. And it just, nothing happened. So, go figure. Yeah, go figure. But it certainly would be nice to revisit at some point. Uh, but, uh, listen. I, of course, I would love to revisit. Because I, I love the first and second album. The, they're two of my all-time favorite albums. And the songs are incredible. And I think there's, you know, there's an audience out there for it based on all the other stuff. If, heck, if nothing else, we'll go do a Monsters of Rock cruise. <laughs> yeah, Monsters of Rock or, or uh, the M3 Festival or Heavy Montreal. Heck, yeah. or, uh, there's all those places. I mean, we could, actually, we could actually go out and really play a lot. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, the first time I ever uh, got to know you and speak to you was with your band Crunk, which was, God, when was that? 80, no, 98? That started late 90s. Yeah. The first album came out around uh, uh, 99 or somewhere around then. And then, uh, you know, we went on, but I was so busy with Scorpions, I never had time to really pursue it, even though we were playing gigs here and there. But um, Crunk turned into Kotak. Yeah, and um, what, what's interesting of, with that is that you come out from behind the drums and you take over lead vocals and guitar. I, is, that, uh, is that something you prefer to do? Is that something you, you would rather do, or is that just... No, it's something, it's, it's a blast. It's very challenging, and, and I can see why, like, Dave Grohl did it, and uh, others do it, because, you know what, you play, you play, I've been playing drums forever, and, and that's, that's fun, but you kind of, like, lose the, the spark or whatever the word is. And then I, I said, okay, you know what, I'll play. and Athena encouraged me to do it because we couldn't get anybody to play our music. And she was co-writing with me, and she goes, well, why don't you just sing? I go, okay, and, and play guitar. I go, well, I suck on guitar. She goes, who cares, you look good. <laughs> and uh, so we had a band and played a bunch of gigs, and I got better, and then it, it kept going. And so now here, four albums later, you know, the record label in, in Germany uh, actually is ones that convinced me to change the name of the band to Kotak because... Crunk had been uh, hijacked by the rappers, if you right. recall the 90s, everybody crunked this, crunked that, oh, we're so crunked up. So anytime you'd Google crunk, you'd get all this rap stuff. So they said Kotak, and I said no, and we submitted 50 different names, and they insisted on Kotak because of the familiarity factor, and there it stuck. Now, the last album, Attack, came out in 2011. Are you still going to record and, and do something, or is it... 
Yeah, you know what? Just uh, I, I want to do another. There, I want to do actually over Christmas. I want to do like a, an acoustic album. But you know what? I, I get into like Christmas mode where I just shut down and don't want to do anything. And uh, I just kind of, you know, I've got a lot of songs, but you got to be excited to want to do it. And also knowing that that Scorpions was coming up, I know I'm, I wouldn't have time to even promote it, even if I did do it. And um, if if you're going to do something, I, I like to do it right and do it all the way. Yeah, you have to. Do you find that, you know, listen, I, I find that as I've gotten older, uh, the weekend is, is not to party. It's to it's to sit down and sleep and watch TV. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Is that the sort of the thing where you're in now where instead of coming off the road and going off and doing bar gigs with Kotak or Krunk or whoever, you go, eh, you know what, I'll just sit by the pool and chill out. Oh, oh, <laughs> dude, that's 100% me. Ride my bike, hang out with the, ki the kids. I mean, our kids are grown. My daughter's like 24 and a hairdresser in Beverly Hills and Miles has got his band. But no, you're right. I, and because what people don't realize is we, we started doing crunk gigs in like 97. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did a, we, we did multiple tours of Germany. We went to Japan like two or three times and we played all over, you know, the Southwest. I mean, we were playing a lot and just after a while, it, it's either going to happen or it's not. And we get to, got to a certain point uh, where 2011, we did a tour with Ed guy and we we're playing like, you know, two, 3000 seaters. And it was like doing really well, but I just couldn't get over that hump. And, um, you you know it, it's either passion project or you're making money on it and i was just not even making money on it so what's the point yeah, after yeah. so after so many years you can only invest so much but i'll definitely be doing another album yeah i'm looking forward to that I, I, you know i always look forward to everything you do you know uh, i thought um humanity hour one was great i thought sting in the tail was great the mtv unplugged i just picked up actually last week the deluxe right. edition with the studio edits i think it was great uh, just looking back on your history with the Scorpions, and, and we'll we'll start winding down here. Uh, eye to Eye, the, the 1999 album, I, that was technically your first one with the band, right? Yeah, well, actually, I played it on Pure Instinct. I did like four tracks. They right. sent the tapes over to, to Los Angeles, and I'm still confused whether the tracks were used or not because I can't tell if it's my drumming or the other guy, Kirk Kretz. And because uh, they, you know, sometimes they fix things digitally and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the guys don't even know because they weren't there. Um, but I, I was, like I said, rock was, I mean, the 90s were not good for rock. And right. uh, everybody's doing their experimental album and they're, they're adding loops to everything and all this. And from day one, I, 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 I wasn't that crazy about the producer they picked. Right. Uh, the songs were, are great. They were just done in the wrong style. They weren't done in Scorpion style. Yeah, you know, but but you came into the band. You you did some sh some shows. You have you know you know the history because like, you grew up like I did. You, oh, of you, course. You, you knew, you, you like, and then you heard these demos. Were you thinking, oh boy, what do I do here? Do I say? I mean, did, are you able to speak up no more? Like, in oh, absolutely, absolutely. They they want that. And you know, I've been friends with these guys since like you know since we did the Monsters of Rock tour in '88. And then, you know, I was always hanging around the studio in L.A. when they were recording Crazy World because Keith Olsen was the same producer as Kingdom Come, Do You Like It? And I did drums for him, so I'd stop at the studio and say hello. And, um, you know, it's it's a tight world. So it, they they even said, like, we don't want to, you know, they don't want to, they don't want a side guy. They want somebody like me who speaks up and, and contributes as opposed to just sitting there like a mouse. That's no fun. And you know what? The thing is, I remember I did about 34 songs because they had all these demos. And I went back in, in about two or three days in LA, went back and redid drums on like 34 songs. My head was spinning. But, uh, and the demos sounded great. And then we went and made the album. <laughs> So, <laughs> and that's, that's where, yeah, you know, listen, I, I think if you look back on uh, anybody's history and I, and I keep referring to Kiss cause I know Kiss more than anybody, right. Um, you know, the elder is sort of like an eye to eye where the band just went, Hey, we got to try something different. And it's sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't, if you try nothing different, they say, Oh, it's the same old thing. Oh, and if you try something different, they crucify you. So. Exactly. Well, you know what? There's there's several theories here. You've got ACDC. Right. You've got McDonald's. You know exactly what you're going to get every single time. No surprises. And you're going to love it. But then you have, you know, other bands. It's like, you know, Bon Jovi 
did a, like a country type album a few years back and, you know, but his fans accept it. And it just, just depends on the band and stuff. And, but you've got to, this is one reason though, why the Scorpions are, has longevity. I mean, we did, we did an, orca, an album with the Berlin Philharmonic in 2000. Then we turned around and did an acoustic album. And then we went and did a, uh, came back and did a rock album, yeah, you know, and, all and we them. toured on all three of them. Yeah. So not many bands can do that. No, not at all. We're really proud of that. And uh, we'll finish with this. You've got Queensryche opening up on the tour. Uh, yes. You know, I'm very excited about that. I think, listen, I love Jeff Tate. I speak to Jeff all the time. But I think the band, as it's going on right now, also makes sense. And um, I think it's sort of a crime to go see them, like, in a bar. So to have them on the big stage opening for one of the world's well, greatest see, bands. That's exactly my point about going out you know, as opposed to going out with a bang or going out, like being a band like that and you're playing in some bar and it's like, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I don't know. That's my, I, it's better to not tour when you're at that level. I think sometimes, Yeah, and, you know, and, and I'm just glad that you, you're bringing them out. Are are you a fan of Queens, right? Are you going to be checking out the, the set list at all? The, I mean, the set at all, or. Well, they've opened up for us a couple of times o- over the years, just like one offs here and there. But uh, I always like Jeff's voice is, was phenomenal. I, I don't think he's with this version of Queens, right? No, he, he's not though. You, yeah. You've got the new version. Yeah, and that's too bad. I wish they would just like just go get some go sit in a room with a psychologist or a therapist and work it out, you know. And then you don't have to travel together. You don't have to stay in the same hotel. You just show up and play the gig. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. which is which is sort of what Motley Crue does, right? I was just going to say, but Mo- Molly does that. It works, and Aerosmith does that. You know, I mean. Yeah. But, you know, it's cool. I think their music is great, and uh, I look forward to it. James, always a pleasure. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, September 19th show at the Bell Center in Montreal. It's, it's going to be a great evening. Well, dude, yeah. make sure you get a hold of me and be my guest and come to the show. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. My wife and I, we love. We, we go all the time. You've never disappointed. And um, Oh, but you didn't hear. It's, it's, it's men only, only now at Scorpion shows. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. isn't, that, isn't that exciting no 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 uh, but, um hey i did want to mention if you don't mind uh, yeah, uh my website is of course uh james of course and that's k-o-t-t-a-k james com. you can uh follow me on twitter at at j kotak uh and uh of course facebook's and uh well, anything else where the internet works <laughs> <laughs> and uh else? Yeah, and, and also, you speaking of Canada, um, you know, I was involved with the XYZ of Rock show. Yep. If I don't know if you ever saw it. Yep. That was kind of fun and stuff. So, you know, check that out. I'm on there a lot, acting drunk and stupid things. <laughs> doing, doing stupid things. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, man. It's that You're talking about, that's the best therapy ever, doing those shows. Yeah, because you watch yourself and you go, oh, fuck, they were right. I am, <laughs> I am like that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. You see a lot of things. Well, man, dude, thank you so yeah. much for your time. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I'll, I'll just keep saying it for people. If you're a fan of the band, go get the deluxe, super deluxe Japanese edition of this because you've got 18 tracks. And it's That's just, a good idea. It's a great it's a great time. And you got Dancing with the Moonlight, which was on the Unplugged album. But here you got it all plugged in and good to go. So Yeah, it's rocking. And uh, also, don't forget our movie, uh, Forever in a Day. We just premiered it in Berlin about a month ago. Yep. It'll be coming out sometime uh within the year and uh we look forward to seeing you on tour yeah absolutely thank you james there you have it folks my interview with james kotak i certainly uh, encourage you to check out return to forever the new album there is a japanese version that has 18 tracks as opposed to the domestic one that only has 12 Uh, i would certainly uh recommend getting the bonus one and of course This episode of One on One brought to you by Heavy Montreal, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Slipknot, Faith No More, Korn, Lita Ford, Lagwagon, Andrew WK, and many, many more. Um, Darren, are we going to be seeing Harem Scarum in Montreal anytime soon? Are you guys going out on the road? Well, uh, my schedule has opened up, so it's a good chance I will be... uh doing a tour through Canada. A lot of fans have contacted me via Facebook to ask about that. I can't speak yet because it's 
we're just we've got to do this a uh, couple of local shows from our hometown in Oshawa, right. and then we're off to uh, play the Frontiers Festival in Milan, and then we're playing a show in Madrid. Then we're home, but because my schedule's opened up, I've told the boys to go ahead and book a tour, possibly through Canada, and and we will be going back to Europe. We have a tour through Japan in July, oh, and. Cool. Uh, it should be good, but I got a little bit of info that nobody knows about, but I'm going to tell you first because it's Go. coming out right now. We have a huge problem. Um, Peter yes. slipped on the ice on Thursday and broke his arm. Oh, so you need a guitarist. We have a guitar player. Okay. <laughs> Peter Peter is going to attend uh, the... Oshawa show on April 2nd in a sling and sing some backups. But we have Michael Vasos, um, a friend of mine, a player a friend of mine for the last 25 years. I've known him since Scarum started back in the day in the, in the late 80s. Um, he's going to be substituting for the two shows. We're hoping Peter's going to be all better for Japan. And we're very confident that he will be. But uh, Michael Vasos is going to step in and handle all of Peter's crazy ass guitar playing. So I think he's going to need a bunch of friends for the next little while. Oh, there you go. So we'll make sure now, uh, you know, the last yeah. time I've interviewed you a couple of times and we've never talked about your solo album from 2005, which I've picked up. I did a solo album. The Darren Smith <laughs> band. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. right. Which for some reason in Japan, I think was called black star or something like that. Um, well, it, it, it was supposed to be called Black Star. I didn't want it to be called the Darren Smith Band, but Germany decided last minute without asking to put my name on the cover, and it wouldn't be so bad if I had a cool ass rock and roll name. Right, <laughs> right. But but Dar Darren Smith seems very. But is that it? Now, now that you're more of a free agent, is there going to be a second Black Star or Darren James Smith Band album? Well. Me, me, and some good friends, Russell and I, we're gonna we're gonna write some music, and we're gonna just see where it goes from there. I'm not really in any frame of mind right now to look at anything like that than what's in front of me. And right now, Harem Scarum's in front of me, and I'm going to dedicate all my time to that and various projects on the side and writing, and just you know get back to why the reason why I started doing this in the first place. Yeah, that sounds good. To come to my open the driveway. That's right. To go to to go to Russell's yeah, place. Oh, yeah. the driveway. Russell says he wants to write songs, but I get up there and he hands me a freaking shuffle. You know, like, <laughs> that or a hammer. I, I know I know his roof needs oh, some patching. There you go. Oh, yeah, oh, we well, spent a lot of time together. <laughs> let's uh, let's move on to the uh, to the second interview today. Barry Stock of Three Days Grace. Uh, they have a new album called Human. Two singles have come out: Painkiller and I Am a Machine. And believe it or not, both have hit number one. Um, Ontario boys, for yeah, great for them. Are, are you, is it part of the circle in Ontario that you guys sort of hang out with? Do you know the guys at all? Or is it sort of like, yeah, I've heard of them. They're, 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 they're good. We, we know what they do. Well, yeah, they're, 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 you know, everybody's proud of that band here. You know, I, I know Barry a little bit. We worked together a few years ago, but uh, as far as the rest of the guys, I, I don't know them per se. Yeah. Right. And Russ, do you know them at all? No, not at all. Any anybody I know. Well, knows. Russell, you have to leave your house to meet people. So. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, like I said, everybody I know is in a senior's home. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now they've. Uh, well, the the other amazing thing yeah. about these two singles going to number one is that they've done it with a new vocalist, Matt uh, Walst, who um, left my darkest days, or in fact, he still does my yeah. darkest days, but he's doing this sort of a double duty now. So. That's impressive. He's, he's still a, doing. He's doing both, eh? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Well, from, wow. from what I understand, there, there's really been sort of no word on whether my darkest days has broken up or not. But I mean, Salvatore mm -hmm. went off and does Smashing Satellites, and and Matt's doing this. I guess we could say the band's in hiatus. But uh, that's impressive, though, when you get a brand new vocalist and you can still manage to hit number one. I mean, it doesn't work that way. I think I, I think maybe only Sammy Hager with Van Halen managed to be sort of more successful than what was before right i mean yeah i would agree yeah, yeah so there you go um russ anything you want to add or shall we get right over to barry 
let's get right over to it. But, you know, there are shows to go again, the Canadians, you just can keep on giving her. Yeah, you got to love that. And hopefully as a Canadian band, someday they will uh, show some love for other Canadian pioneers and bring out the Dwarves and, and uh, Harem Scarum and, you know, all those great Canadian bands out there. Anyway, uh, let's get to uh, Barry Stock talking about the album Human. Uh, and of course, they are great two singles, Painkiller and I Am a Machine. Here's Barry. So Barry, well, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the most important thing right up the front here. Uh, I know you have a new singer, and I know all about that stuff. Well, let's just talk about Human, the album. Um, you had a song, Painkiller, and an I Am a Machine that came out in two thousand fourteen. Um, you know, here they are on the album. T tell me a little bit about why not just have released those as singles? Why are they still on this album? And what what is it? What were you trying to do with this album? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we didn't have a plan in the beginning per se, but when, you know, as soon as we, you know, Matt came aboard, mm -hmm. you know, it was such a good vibe and everything. We started writing songs right away. Right. And, you know, Matt had this uh, initial painkiller idea. So we went in and wrote it right away. And it was so good. We thought, let's record it. And then, you know, in the meantime, while we were, you know, creating songs and everything, we thought, you know, why don't we release that? Like, get it out to the people. Why make them wait? Right. You know, and, uh, you know, and then as we went on and then we wrote other songs, you know, we had, you know, while we were still touring, we were kind of, you know, going in now and then and recording and trying out a few songs. And as that went on, you know, we had I Am Machine came about and then, you know, we thought, why just not wait? Why don't we just build all this to the record? And as we got closer, we started to realize, you know, this this whole album really did for us have a, this real human element you know, it kind of takes us back to the early few records, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff happened in our lives in the last few years. And, uh, as we go through the songs, you know, you can, you can feel that, you know, we kind of just pulled all that from our, our experiences over the last few years, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, let me ask you about Adam, you know, for most bands, the voice is the attraction, you know, you think of Aerosmith, you think of Steven Tyler, you think of, uh, you know, the singer, like, you know, Cheap Trick, Robin Zander. Um, was it difficult losing him? I mean, when he left, did you think, oh, God, what do we do now? Or was it like, okay, well, that new challenge? Well, no, I mean, of course, it was, you know, it was, we were totally shocked when it happened, right? You know, right. and, uh, and you know, and Adam is a great singer, you know, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, initially you feel that little, holy shit, you know, what, what are we doing here, right? But, um with uh you know matt comes into play and he just you know really picked up the pace and he's just like a different guy it's almost you know with van halen changing up it's it'll always be different it'll always be a little different but uh you know i think for us there's just this whole new energy right. you know it's us just moving forward and this whole entirely new vibe that's going on that it's it feels really good you know it feels like us you know it's just a new cool next step for us you know? Yeah, it really is. And and of course, I think fans responded well because both the singles, Painkiller and I Am a Machine, hit number one in the States. Yeah, I mean, we did really well with it. And the and the fans were very accepting, which was great. I mean, right from when we started touring, we went on, let's just tour, 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 and, uh, you know, show that we, we you know, we're rocking. And, and it, it was great. And everybody vibes really well together. So mm -hmm. it's been a really good thing. And, you know, everybody's pretty much been behind us. So it's been a good vibe for us and to carry on for sure. With the songs hitting number one, you know, in 19 sort of 87, when you had a number one song, it was the be all and end all. You had beaten everybody else, and it was. Does is it still as important in this day and age to have a number one single? Well, I mean, it's a nice feeling for sure. You know, that means you know it just shows that you know, uh, you know, because fans call these things in and they request and everything. It just shows you know you got the love of the people behind it. You know, so. When you see all these bands doing well and climbing up the charts, it's, you know, we don't stare at that or anything else, but, you know, it's a, it's a nice reward when it happens. It, it feels good because it feels like, you know, you've got a bunch of great people behind you. And, you know, and always having, you know, singles and stuff, you know, it's great for touring. You know, people sing these songs. They all know the songs. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's cool. It's a cool feeling. It really is. Now, like you said, you went and got Matt from My Darkest Days. Uh, was that a risk taking a, a singer that that was associated with a different band and and also had a lot of success? The song "Porn Star Dancing" in two thousand ten was everywhere on radio. Um, mm -hmm. Was it a bit of a gamble? Um, I don't I don't think so because okay. um, 
Like, yeah, I mean, My Darkest Days was a very different kind of band, and I think, and they were a different kind of band than Three Days Grace. And I, mm-hmm. I think for the fans initially, their response was, "Oh, maybe he's too clean a singer because he sings a different way and stuff with that band, which is great." And it's just, but like I said, we're a kind of different band. And uh, but y- you know, like his, his passion and everything, you know, he's he's so good, and he just has his own unique thing. You know what I mean? Like he really does. Um, so I, I don't look at it like a, a gamble. The re, the biggest reason is that he's Brad's brother. Um, you know, and, and Matt's been there from day one. He's co-wrote right. on the first record. He's co-wrote on the last record. Obviously we wrote all this record together. So, I mean, when, with the stories of three days, grace, he, you know, he more than anybody, uh, knows where they come from. Right. And that's really important for a singer, you know, to express because he knows where the story is coming from. Right whether it was his story or his buddy's story or something, it's our story. Well, Matt, Matt being a brother, he, he knows all that. So he can push that out too. Cause he knows what we were going through in certain times of our lives when those songs are written. So even if he didn't sing on them, you know what I mean? He understands where they come from. So he gets the feeling for sure. Right. So, so in, in that sense, yeah, it definitely, you know, it was not a risk at all. It made, made the most sense. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned Van Halen because when you look at the two bands, there, there's almost a comparison. You, you've got a singer that had a, a past, a successful past, much like Sammy Hager. And now you've got two brothers in there, right? Like the Van Halen brothers. So yeah, you, yeah, true enough. You've got that whole uh, comparison going now. Now for Matt, though, has he put My Darkest Days to bed? Is he free to go do solo albums and do other? No, albums? I mean he- no. Yeah, he's still, I mean, you know, I think he still has a commitment to those guys. I think right now, I, I, you know, his guys are cool. He understands that this is what he's doing right now. You know, I, you know, Matt doesn't hold that back. He's, you know, he's really excited to be, you know, uh, one of three days grace now, you know, we're a team now. So, but uh, he'll, he'll definitely at some point be doing some of my darkest days for sure. Okay. And, and that's something that of course the band is, is perfectly comfortable with. Um, I would imagine, right? Oh yeah, I mean, at some point, you know, we'll take a break and allow him to to do his thing there, and you know, and to have his commitment there, and uh, you know, everybody's good with all that. We're all good buddies now, you know, so everything's cool. You know, you've uh, you've gotten a chance to play this festival in Montreal called Heavy Montreal 2008, and in 2014, I was just curious to know what does that kind of festival mean for the scene for 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 hard rock and metal is it important is it just uh, another tour date uh you know no, I, I think they're super cool i mean shows like that you know are cool for us because we're you know we play around and you know through the nice weather months you know all through the states and canada we play lots of festivals and they're a lot different but a lot of times they lump you know similar bands together and you'll see each other a lot on these festivals but for us that one was particularly cool because you know i don't i don't you know, we don't consider ourselves a metal band at all. You know, right. we're a rock band. But right. So to be actually put into, you know, where we can step up our show and play against these really cool, you know, playing with Metallica, man, how bad yeah. I do that, right? That's right. You know, so it's a it's a great feeling to be, you know, you know, to be able to come in and hold your own in, in cool shows like that that are very different than what you might normally be lumped in with. You know? Yeah, I mean, what a what an incredible show last year. You you were on the uh, on the ninth of August with Metallica, I believe. You were, you were on that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, we got to hang out with him a little bit backstage and talk a little bit. We shared the same manager, so it was cool. Really great guys. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun for us. Yeah, a lot of fun. So for a band coming out of Canada, is it more, is is there a, is it a little more complicated to, to get uh, support in the States, you know, or is it, or was it just a little, you know, you let the music do the talking kind of thing? Well, to be honest, I think it, I, I, I think it depends on, you know, like if I think the way I see it, it seems harder if, if a band had a Canadian deal and then they're trying to get a, an American deal, you know, the thing with three days grace in the beginning, you know, we had American deal, American management, you know, so it kind of helped us to just be part of that. You know what I mean? Like, whereas I definitely do see it where, you know, bands that I know that are, you know, we have some great Canadian bands that they had a Canadian deal and then they have a harder time getting, you know, to be accepted down there a little bit. Well, sometimes I scratch my head, but I think it just might be the business a bit. They don't, you know, in America, they might just want to think of it as their own and maybe they're not as accepting as they would just take one of their own bands or something, you know, maybe it could be something to do that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, you've, your human comes out at the end of March. 
Is it still important for bands to make new albums given the sort of digital distribution system we have now? You had the two singles, they were obviously very successful. Is it important for a band to put together 10, 12, 14 songs and call it an album? I, I do. I think for a band, it definitely is important. You know, whether people still, you know, for the majority of people might just, you know, buy the singles and stuff. You know, I think that's cool that you have the ability to do that. Um, but to do a record is you know, important for a band because it tells a bigger story. Right. You know, if you just release a song, they're just songs about this or that or that. But when you lump it all together, that's a moment uh, in our lives. You know what I mean? That's a couple of years of our lives right there. And, you know, as we always do with Three Days Grace, you know, we use uh, music as a vent, you know what I mean? We, we speak about, or sing about, you know, speak about the things we, you know, go on around us, you know, whether it's uh, loss, you know, we've got some loss or whether it's addictions or things or mm -hmm. anything, we bring it out in our music and then always have this sense of hope in the end. But those are the things we talk about with our music. So, so yeah, you know, I think it's really important to have uh, a record because it shows people it's a bigger thing. And then you put art with that and everything, and it paints a bigger picture. It's like this is a moment in time now. It's not just a song that went by. It's, a, it's actually a thing, you know, a whole bigger thing. When you're putting together the album, though, do you see it as these songs have to have an ebb and flow? They have to go together? Or is it really just 12 individual songs stuck on a package? Well, no, I, 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 sort of both. Like, you know, as you're writing, you just keep, you know, in our case, we just keep trying to write the best songs we can, you know, and you, we, you might write 30 songs, you know, right. but I mean, a lot of times it's obvious which are the better ones or, or sometimes, you know, you might pick one, you know, because as you get closer near the end of a record, you start to see, well, okay, well, what are we missing? You need to think of those things if you are looking at, at like, a, like a record, like a piece of work. Right. Because you might have you don't want to add another ballad, for example, if you've already got a few really good ones or, you know, things like that. So as you get closer to the end of a record, I find is where you can go, OK, what's it missing? Right. You know, we, you know, do we need the more up tempo song in there to just to add it in? Might not have been the best song, but you would have picked it because of, you know, it's adding the flavor to a, to a record. You know, it's not all single driven. Right. It's a it's now an album. It's a creation of, of work that we went through over the last two years. Is it not single driven, though? I mean, do they not just say, hey, I need a song for radio? Is that is that still important? Does radio still play an important part of what makes Three Days Grace a band and, and make it work? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, you know, we definitely, you know, it's what helps to keep us successful, you know, and we do try to write the best songs we can. Okay. You know, there's nothing more enjoyable when there's thousands of people singing back to you. I mean, that's what we get a, a kick out of more than anything, the live show and then, you know, so it does matter to us, you know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, we like other stuff, too. We like the darker side of things, too. So we love that B side. You know, we're not all single driven, but there's we definitely focus a certain amount on, hey, let's write, you know, the top quality song we can. As songwriters, we're all songwriters in our band. Right? We all write. We all write lyrics. So that's very important for us. But like I said, you know, there's many things that drive us, too, that we love, you know, musicianship and cool riffs. And yeah. so, you know, again, that's when you do a record. That's why to us it's important. It's not just singles. Not just yeah, you definitely want the, you know, the popular songs and that, but so people can get and want to listen to the rest of your work, you know, because you do have other cool things to offer. Being a Canadian artist, uh, we have something in Canada called CanCon, Canadian content where radio has to play a certain amount of uh, Canadian uh, bands and music. Is that still mm -hmm. important for Three Days Grace? Did, did it help the band in any way or are those sort of an outdated kind of regulatory thing that we should just get rid of no i don't i don't think we should get rid of it like again i, I you know for us i don't it's i don't think this is as a worry and the reason why it is a good thing is because i think you know generally if not if it wasn't in place i i believe there's a lot of radio that would just play what's most popular period in north america right which for the most part could be a bunch all a bunch of american bands, which is not necessarily the greatest thing for canada Right. So I think having a certain amount of that, like we were talking about earlier, is the, the you know, there's bands that really rely on Canada. You know, they don't do as well across the border. So it's important that they get heard and they, you know, so it, there's, a, I think that's a really good thing because a lot of bands really rely on that because they're great bands too. And if, 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 uh, if the Canadian channels were just allowed to play again, what's most popular, they, they may just be playing all the, you know, the other stuff. And then, these poor bands get left out in their own country, which is not fair. I don't think at all, right? So 
I think it's a good thing. I think it should it should, it should, should stay. Definitely. But but I mean the dynamic yeah. has changed now. Back in the day, you turned on the radio, be it Q one oh seven or Show Me FM or whatever, and you you got to hear what they chose. But now you can just go over to Spotify or you can go to any of these things. You can sort of choose, right? So does it not become sort of unfair competition in a sense that if the radio is not playing what's most popular, we can just go find it somewhere else? Yeah, I guess you could look at both sides of the coin, yeah. you know, it's really what you feel, you know, I mean, I, I kind of root for the underdog a little bit in, the set, in that sense, you know, I think, you know, I wouldn't want to just totally take away, we have some great talent here that I, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to name any bands, but there's definitely some great talent in this country that might not get the play they deserve otherwise, you know, in, in that sense, but, you know, so that's just my opinion on it. Now, with uh, Matt in the band now, and we, we mentioned before My Darkest Days, when you go see Three Days Grace, is it just Three Days Grace songs, all, that's it, that's all? Or is there room for a My Mar- Di- Darkest Day song in there? No, I mean, we would never be playing My Darkest Day song. Okay. You know, we're not My Darkest Days, right? So, you know, I mean, we, we like My, My Darkest Days, too. It's just a different kind of thing that, you know, okay. totally with us. You know, it's more like Matt's really fit in with us, and we're a great little team. But it's, it's a, it really is a different dynamic altogether. I mean, I don't even... You know, we didn't. You know, that that's its sort of own entity. You know, that needs to be played differently. So I don't, I don't think we'll ever, ever be playing those kind of songs. You know, but it's, hence why we've done a record with Matt. Though now Matt's in the band, and we'll, always, you know, we're going to be able to play a lot more of that, right? You know, this time around, which is great. You know, we can play a good, you know, five, six songs. Right. You know, as, as opposed to just one or two. So it's going to be a lot of fun. What does he add to the band vocally? I mean, was it entertaining, or was it, was it pleasant going into the studio the first time and hearing him do? Uh, you know, does he add a range? What, what does he add to the band? I mean, again, he's got his own flavor. He's, you know, Matt has this great energy and he, you know, uh, he, he fits right in, you know, he just, he's got his own way of doing it. It's, it was amazing how, actually how well he blended in with what we did without trying to sound like Adam or anything, right? He's just being his own guy, but he's way more aggressive than anybody would have thought, you know, because with My Darkest Days, again, that's a different kind of band. Right. You know, which he's, you know, it's a little bit more on the pop rock side, so it's a little cleaner, but that's deliberate. You know, that's what they are, right? So for us, it's definitely more aggressive. So to see him come in now on a record that he's written on with us was very exciting, very exciting for him. And, you know, the motion he put into it was awesome to sort of see him go in there and just, he had something to prove, right? He wanted to go and tear it up. So, it was, you know, he's, a, he's, he's awesome on this record. Now, the one story that I always tell people about uh, Three Days Grace is years ago, somewhere around, I guess, 2006, you were on tour with Breaking Benjamin. Um, And you were playing a show at the Metropolis in Montreal. And I happened to be standing on the stage on the side watching the band. And your singer um, threw the mic stand in my direction. Now, I was there at the time with my daughter, who was three. And it flew over her head by about an inch. (laughs) And uh, I always say, Three Days Grace is the band that almost killed my daughter. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But 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 that was it. Was such an exciting show. It was such a great thing. Um, What's coming up for for Three Days Grace in terms of touring for the for the rest of the year? Oh, we're going to be busy. I mean, as of, you know, we're just, we just finished full, full production rehearsals. Okay. Um, you know, that was great. And then we just got a few days at home here. And then we're, uh, Thursday night, we head to South America. We've got uh, a couple of Lollapaloozas down there and a few shows of our own. We do Buenos Aires. We do Rio. We do Sao Paulo in Brazil. And then we head back on the 31st for a record release in New York. And then we got about a week off, and then we start a West Coast tour, uh, California. We're we'll doing all out there in Arizona and Vegas and stuff for pretty much all of April. End up in Dallas, and and then uh, yeah, we, we're doing a bunch of stuff in Europe this year. We got a bunch of big festivals uh, opening for Metallica in Milan, and uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, yeah, opening for Metallica is always great. Now uh, you're out in Ontario. Are you a Toronto Maple Leafs fan by any chance? I don't watch hockey as much as I used to, but I would ha- I would have to say yeah I would have to root Toronto because the area because I just grew up you know we are as Canadians and you understand uh, you know we're all born with a hockey stick so I know if I had to root I would say yeah but it's you know <laughs> been a, been a been a rough one for you this year oh it's been a rough one for a while so. <laughs> <laughs> for for a long time and 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 a few more yeah. years to come um, yeah and then, it could uh, be. 
Uh, and I'll finish with this. Uh, when you put together an album, because if you really look at your history, you've done albums pretty much every three years. Do you just do nothing? And not, not, not. Sorry, I don't mean to infer you do nothing. But is there like no songwriting that goes on for like two years while you tour, and then on the third year you get together and okay, let's come up with twelve songs, or do you just sort of collect songs along the way, and then when it's time to record, you go, okay, what do we have in the closet, kind of thing? What is the the process? Well, in the past, it was always, yeah, I mean, it's hard. You, you know, when you tour, there's so much other things you're doing that mm -hmm. people oh, don't see. They just think you put on the show every night. But there's so many other things, you know, interviews every day, meet and greets. You know, so you're really sleep. busy a lot. <laughs> right? Yeah, try to sleep. Oh, Obviously, yeah. yeah, sleep and catch up because everything's a late, later evening, you know, the way we entertain. So you're right. So you sleep a lot. So it's hard to find time. It really is. So that more of anything, you're all, but we're always putting together ideas. So everybody, it, a lot of times it's not to you're off the road and everybody collectively puts in all their ideas and, and then we hammer it out. This time around was a little different for us because we, we started writing with Matt right away and we were still doing shows. So it was a different experience for us that way. Like we could, you know, do a little tour, come back, you know, so we didn't get a lot of time off. We'd come back and then get into writing right away or jump in the studio and do, do a couple ideas we had and, so there's a lot of that over the whole last, you know, almost a year and a half of that, you know, sort of in and out. So it was a different process this time around. Right. Well, hey, absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, of course, I wish you the best with with Human. I've had a chance to hear it. I think it's fantastic, quite frankly. I've been following Thank you, you thanks to uh, our good friend Stéphane Drolet in uh, Montreal yeah. for, for years. He's always uh, let me have a chance to listen to the stuff. And uh, hey, it's another winner. Absolutely another awesome. winner. Thank so, you very much. Man. Absolutely. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll see right. you on the road. Take care. Bye-bye. There you have it, folks. My interview with Barry of Three Days Grace. The new album is Human. And, of course, before that, we had James Kotak of The Scorpions and their new album, Returned to Forever. And all this fun was brought to you by the Heavy Montreal Festival, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, with... Uh, Mastodon, Bullet for My Valentine, Meshuga, Within Temptation, Lita Ford, Warrant, Dokken, Gojira, Testament, Marky Ramon. Uh, of course, the Killer Dwarves and Harem Scarum are missing, but hey, that's the way the cookie crumbles. But maybe next year, right, boys? Maybe. Maybe next year. <laughs> maybe next year. Um, so, Darren, uh, always a pleasure talking to you. I know I know things have been a little, little bit in upheaval these days, but I think... Uh, Landing with Harem Scarum is a is a good thing for fans, especially because uh, it's a great band. Very, yeah, yeah, you know, and and a, a great brotherhood. And I've I've been part of every one of their records they've ever done. I think they did one without me, but we are we are true friends, and so we we always get together when uh when time allows, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, will you be getting out front and doing any of the singing with Harem, or are you going to just sort of stay back on the drums and just be the drummer for a while? Uh, I, I sing a couple of songs, uh, lead, I'll, I'll sing it from the drum kit. Um, there's I'd be, there'd be no point in bringing another drummer out just to, for one or two songs, I guess, but <laughs> you, can yeah, do you know, I mean, uh, I, I sing all night long with Harem Scarum. It's a very vocal affected band. So right. yeah, you know, I play drums again for a little while. And of course, Russ, uh, the killer dwarves have some American dates coming up and then you will be in Canada, uh, Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, as part of a bill with Mike Tramp of White Lion fame. And, of course, Russ, you, you do remember you have promised to do Kiss His Hard Luck Woman at those shows for me. Correct? I, I, I promise. Darren, you're there with Bobby now. Tell Bobby we got to do Hard Luck Woman. Nick <laughs> going to sing it. <laughs> right on. If I have to sing a couple of notes to make it happen, I certainly will. But, uh, yeah, it, it'll maybe be we'll, great. Maybe we'll bring Darren out to Ottawa. There you go. That'll, that's a good idea. And of course, uh, folks, if you want to follow Russ, uh, head over to Twitter to at Russ Dwarf uh, for Darren. I guess we've, we've got HaremScarum.net, but any, anywhere else where people can find you? Oh, Facebook. Yeah. Good old Facebook. There you go. That, that's the easiest place. And yeah. of course, if you want to find me, you can head over to Facebook uh, slash one on one Mitch Lafon, and of course at Mitch Lafon on Twitter. There you go, folks. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you to uh, James and of course Barry. Um, good night, folks. Cheers. Cheers. There you go. Cheers.